Man, oh man, a shabbis. I got a guy on the channel. He got the hat, the shirt. He got the, the people behind, the statues behind him. He ready to go to tell you this story. And I'm not going to tell you what the story is, but as soon as you see him, you'll know what the story is. But he ready to tell you this story on Strong Inspirations. Well, we give it to you straight, no chase. Oh my God. If you can handle it, here you are. If you want to know some black history, you at the right place. All right. And so do me a favor. Come on now. You know what I'm going to ask you. Hit the subscribe button on this channel. Hit the like button on this video. My man got dressed for you, my friends. So do that. Hit the notifications bell because I'm putting four or five videos up a week. I'm jamming. People calling me now. I'm telling you, this thing is blowing up. The people got these stories they want to tell and I want you to hear them. I'm excited. I like hearing them. I ain't lying. I'll be sitting there like, dang, I ain't know that. I, I'm going to do that with this guy. Why? I'm a man. I ain't know that. And then tell somebody about strong inspirations don't keep this to yourself thinking you don't know everything you don't want nobody else to know you sitting around the bar or something like that hey man did you know this they're gonna look at you like you some genius and stuff like that and you got it off strong inspirations i can appreciate you doing that i understand your game plan but nonetheless let everybody know especially them younger ones too right and then my friends Watch my movie, Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. And when I say my movie, I wrote it, directed it, I hired the production crew, found the people that we interviewed and everything in my project on the rise of black business in America. Slaves went to college, slaves who bought their freedom. Uh, it's unbelievable stories in here, I watch me. It's only 75 minutes long. And uh, this is the DVD right here, see? But uh, it's also streaming on Amazon. So if you don't have a DVD player, you can get it off Amazon. And then I wrote the book. I'm a, I'm a bad dude, watch me now. I wrote the book, Black Business Book. It's got over 200 facts about black business, about slavery, about stuff the racist people that tried to do to us. I got two, three chapters on that. And it's not just Tulsa. All that's in this book. And I don't give you no commentary. I just give it, like I say, straight no chaser. So once you read it, you be like, oh man, dang, that's deep. I give you the reference where I found it. And you can look it up and get more information. And that's my book. They both are available on Amazon. But if you want to cut the big man out on Amazon, you can go directly to my website, businessintheblack.net. And if you want to be in business, that's where you want to be, in the black. That's the one thing that in the black works, is in business, for sure, my friends. So I'm so excited that this brother, he say, hey, man, I want to come on your show. He done sent me messages. I can't wait. <laughs> I'm ready to go. Come on, man. Let Betty telling me not quit talking so much. Let's get it on. So go ahead and introduce yourself. You know, let me do your thing. Let me introduce myself then. My name is Charles Hancock. I am the president of the Southwest Association of Buffalo Soldiers. We're located in Sierra Vista, Arizona. That's adjacent to Fort Huachuca military installation. In the background, you see the statute of the Buffalo Soldier. So part of our chapter is to tell the true and accurate story of the Buffalo Soldier beginning in 1866. Okay, let me stop you there. We got, we got, we gonna, let me, I, I, the question's coming to my mind. Hey man, how you, how you get to do this, man? How you get to be uh, the president and the Buffalo? Is that something you always liked when you was a kid? The Buffalo, you know, what happened to you? When I was a child, I never knew anything about the Buffalo soldiers until 1985. 1985, I was assigned to Fort Huachuca. And I, upon arrival here, I found out that this was the home of the Buffalo Soldiers. All right, let's go with them. Where are you from? I'm from Leeds, Alabama. And, and how you hear about the Buffalo? Just because you got to the city, that's how you first heard about it? I didn't uh, hear about arrived, it in grade school. No, when I arrived here at Fort Huachuca, 
that's where uh, th that statue did that you see in the background here. Yeah. I saw that statue and there were the signs of Fort Huachuca. Welcome to Fort Huachuca, home of the Buffalo Soldiers. So, you, so you're not like a descendant of a Buffalo soldier, you don't think, anything like that? No, I've done my genealogy and research. No, I did not have any Buffalo soldiers in my, in my family and lineage. No. I, are you a military person? I retired from the Army with 30 years of active duty. Oh, man, I so appreciate you. So that's why you got this in your blood anyway, that military type attitude. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and so that's a good thing. So... Uh, you you arrive and then uh, you go to wherever you are at the fort and you see the Buffalo Soldier. You say, I'm going down there to see what's going on or something. Absolutely. I wanted to know who these people were. You know, what was their what is it? What was their story? Did, 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 you, did you always like black history? Oh, absolutely. I've immersed myself into black history. Oh, really? OK, I got you. I got you. Yeah. And then coming from where you where you grew up, was there black history in your town? I grew up in Leeds, Alabama. Never heard of it. The most prominent person from Leeds, Alabama, other than myself, my name is Charles Hancock. I like it. Is Charles Barkley. Charles Barkley is from Leeds, Alabama, the basketball player. Yeah, yeah, we know Big Mouth Charles, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, we are both from Leeds, Alabama. Oh, and, and so uh, was, was is there slavery in Leeds, Alabama? I'm sure, right? Now, of course, Alabama was one of those uh, states that seceded from the Union. So Alabama was a slave state, of course, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and uh, again, I'm gonna go back to you just a little bit. Did your folks, that, that were they, how, how far did you go back in your family anyway or something like that? Okay, and I can trace my third great-grandfather to 18, eight, uh, yeah, 1842. His name was Henry Clay Hancock, born in Tallapoosa County, Alabama. So I can go back to 1842 on my- well, He was a slave. Now, from what I know, now he was on a slave plantation. Now, whether he was a, actually a slave or not, I have not been able to verify that, but he, his owner was a, on the slave uh, plantation, yes. Oh man, hold on, we're gonna get to the Buffalo Soldiers, but I kind of do the sidebar just because you got all this knowledge I'm trying to get it on. So you you thinking that there could be black people to live on the plantation and not be the slave, enslaved? Uh, yes, there were some free free slaves, even in the state of Alabama, there were some free slaves. Now, I have not been able to ascertain whether my third great grandfather was actually free or not, but he was on a plantation in Tallapoosa, Alabama in 18, uh, 1842 is when he was born. Oh, oh okay. Um, would you would you rather know that he was was he that he was free or uh, you got to go with the story as it's told? Right now, I go with the story as told because now there are stories from his descendants who give us the indication that he was free, that he was not actually a slave. Oh, really? Yes. Now, I have not, like I say, I have not been able to verify that because if you look at the slave schedule of What's Alabama, the slave yeah, schedule? yeah, the slave schedule, they list the, the name of the plantation owner, which we know who he was, and then they list whether it was a male or a female and their ages, but the slaves were not listed by name. But what's now, the slave schedule? Hold on, what's the slave schedule? Okay, now you have like your census report? Yeah. Now the census lists everyone uh, by city, by state, you know, county. They, yeah. the, the census is listed by name. Mm. But then the, for the slave, slaves were not listed by name. They gave the slave owner and then they gave the the ages and the sex of the slave, but the slaves were not listed by name. It's called the slave schedule. Mm. Is that something they accounted for? They had to do that for tax reasons probably too, though, they got to pay taxes yes, because, on it. Yes, because uh, the slave owners, they own, they own their, prop, their land, their property, so they had to pay taxes, yes. Mm. That's deep. I, it's deep to know that they considered us that bad uh, what I mean bad is not so human that they got to pay tax on us. You know what I mean? I'm well, blacks were, well, the, the term color was used in that time. They were property. They were listed as property. So the slaves, mm -hmm. they had to pay taxes on their property. Mm. Now, after the Civil War, you know, the, the South, they lost the Civil War. Yeah. All of those slave owners, they had amassed a huge debt to the federal government. 
Oh, really? So, oh, absolutely. So when those Yankees you know, came to the South, those Southern, they had to sell off their assets in order to pay, you know, their bills. Okay, hold on. Let me stop you there. What was the debt for? Uh, now, of course, a lot of those guys, they went into debt when they joined, uh, and I've traced my ancestry back. A lot of the family members, they actually joined the Civil War. Right. They were actually soldiers in the Civil War. Okay. Uh, the production of crops was waning in the South, so the Southerners were not able to sell their goods and services as they were prior to this okay. beginning of the Civil War. So they had a lot of debt. Okay, now go back to the beginning you were going to go to. Okay, I got you. Okay, right after the Civil War ended in 1865, uh, Congress authorized colored soldiers or colored men to join the regular peacetime army in 1866. 1866, okay? Those soldiers would eventually be called Buffalo Soldiers. So... Though in 1866, Congress authorized the creation of six all African American or colored regiments. There were two cavalry regiments, a 9th and 10th cavalry, and there were four infantry regiments. Let me stop you there. What's the difference? Okay, the cavalry, okay, think of the cavalry as those guys who ride the horses and they have the saber. Okay. Where an infantryman, you know, he we call them the ground pounders. They are the mm -hmm. infantry soldiers. They march and walk wherever they, they go. The cavalry guy rode the horse. Okay. Okay. So there were two cavalry. How many people, how many of them is it, do you think, at that point? Well, a regiment at that time consisted of between 800 and 1,500 men per regiment. Oh, really? Okay. Now, there was a caveat. All of the soldiers, that were enlisted into these regiments were colored. However, all of the officers had to be white. So they were yeah, commanded by something. white officers. Yeah, it's always something, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they all came from everywhere, all over the country to volunteer all over, somewhere. All, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that volunteer. Since there was no draft in those times, all of these men were volunteers. Now they were former slaves, they were freedmen, and they were part of what we call the U.S. Colored Troops. Okay. These were the men who made up what we know as the Buffalo Soldiers. They enlisted for five years. That was their term of enlistment. And they were paid a whopping $13 a month. That was their pay. Is that good money? That was good money in 1866, my friend. Okay. Considering okay. a lot of these people uh, right off the, off the plantation, this was the first paycheck these men had uh, ever earned. Okay, let me, let me, uh, I, I'm going through my timeline. Okay, they asked him to list, where do the men go first? Okay, now those cavalry men started off in um, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. The 10th Cavalry was formed at, at Fort Leavenworth, Ca uh, Kansas. The 9th Cavalry stood up in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. Now those infantry regiments, primarily they stood up in New Orleans also in, in the Louisiana you know, territory. Now we're in the South, still in the South primarily. But once those regiments were formed, they sent those soldiers west of the Mississippi River. Now what was west of the Mississippi River? That was all Indian territory. Uh, now, this is uh, one, one person's personal opinion. The United States Army did not want black men with guns on the East Coast. I can dig it. Okay, so all of those men, they were sent to the West Coast. Uh, present day uh, Texas, Oklahoma, those, yeah. You know, every, okay, every let me ask you this. How, how did they get there? Did they have to walk or they, they did horse and buggy or stuff? You know what I'm saying? Because there's a lot of walking going on. Horse and buggy, you had, uh, uh, yeah, of course, they, they rode. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, I got you. Now, you did have stage coaches back in 1866, you know, also. Oh, okay. Right. I got you. So now they send them all out to, where does the first place they go or they just scatter them out the West End? Well, they were scattered all around. Like if you had the Ninth Calvary, I mean, uh, the, uh, you know, the Ninth Calvary, they were, they were probably down in what present day Texas. The 10th Calvary, they were all the way up as far as Montana, okay? So they were all over the Western territory at the time. 
Okay. You know, we're talking about manifest destiny, you know, during the 1800s, where all of what was Indian territory was being uh, eaten up and becoming part of the, of the United States. So you. Oklahoma was still a territory. So we had a large contingency of uh, Buffalo soldiers in Oklahoma. So there's a military installation in Oklahoma called Fort Seal. That's a, an artillery uh, installation today. But Buffalo soldiers helped build that installation. In fact, that was part of their job or their mission. They helped build roads, bridges. They guarded the stage. They provided escorts to the stage coaches. But their primary role was to engage with the Native Americans, subdue these guys, and move them onto Indian reservations. That was their primary role. Oh, okay, let me stop you there. This is crazy. So, what the government, what you're telling me, is the government said, "Hey, black men, go out there and deal with the Indians." Absolutely, absolutely. So who were the, the enemies? Oh, well, I, that's a strong word to use right, right. now, the white man, the right. black man and the Indian. Right. So you send the black man out, out west and say, hey, go out there and take care of these Indians. Wow. Now, they weren't the only one. Now we had, I uh, have to mention that, we had white soldiers out there all in, here. Okay, all good, time. okay, okay, good. I didn't know that. Okay. So the black soldiers weren't the only ones out here. They supplemented the white soldiers. You know. Okay, let me ask you this. So if you're saying that's maybe 800, there is, on the high side, we estimate 10,000 Buffalo soldiers initially. Okay, right. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's another however many thousand white soldiers. Yes. Can the, can the Buffalo soldiers do anything with the white soldiers, or they still kept them apart? Oh, they were still separated. Like I said, the officers were white. Right. But no, that was total uh, segregation. No. How, how high of a rank could a black soldier, Buffalo soldier get? Is there a rank for him? Yes. Now, we the, the highest rank in for the enlisted men in the Army is a sergeant major. And that was my retired you know, pay grade. I retired as a sergeant major. Okay. okay. So we had uh, 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 sergeant major Buffalo soldiers. Okay. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, when you look at it, and I've never, I, I, excuse me for this, I, I, I must admit, I've never been in the service. Okay, I, I enlist, and when I'm a Buffalo soldier, and then there's a sergeant major, what does the sergeant major do? Does he, he's, a, he's the first line of contact between him and the, the infantry people and, 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 and the, the new people to tell them go over there and shoot, uh, what we do, whatever. Well, the primary role of the sergeant major, like I said, that's the highest rank okay. within the enlisted rank. Okay. His, his or her job, her today, is to make sure that those soldiers are trained, first of all. Oh, okay. really? Okay. That, yeah. Now, one step below the sergeant major is that person we call the first sergeant. Okay. Uh -huh. Now, that first sergeant is the guy who take those soldiers on patrol, et cetera, and make sure they uh, are uh, doing their mission. That's the first sergeant's job. Okay, okay. What, 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 what could be a mission for a Buffalo? Like you told me about the, the roads and all that, but in terms of dealing with the Indians, what could be their mission? I see some Indians over there. I'm gonna go over there and tell them, hey man, you gotta leave. Or, or how does that go? Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, someone has to have identified an area where Indians are uh, occupying. So the Buffalo soldiers would be assigned to go to that area and encounter those Indians. Now, those Indians are not going to give up freely or whatever. So there was a battle between the Buffalo soldiers and the Indians. So if they did not uh, surrender peacefully, then they ended up, uh, you know, in a shooting, you know, contest. But their primary mission at that time was to engage with these Native Americans, subdue them, and move them onto Indian reservations. Let me stop you. There. Do you think there was ever any peaceful uh, negotiation with the Indians to say, "Hey, we don't want to kill y'all. Y'all just got to go." I'm pretty sure there was. Um, but here again, that's one of the things I cannot I got you, know, you. I got you. Yeah, that's, that's... now because you had, yeah, well, okay, sure, you had, you know, guys like General Crook, some of the other commanders, they had sent scouts onto Indian reservations uh, where the Indians were and said, look, you guys got to give up your territory. Either you give up your territory or we're coming in and forcefully 
remove you. So yes, there was some negotiation, yes. Uh, um, and the Buffalo soldiers, you know how black people are, we good at it. So they were, they were, I'm sure, pretty effective. And the Indians said, oh, don't send us the black guys, we'll shoot the white guys, but don't the black guys gonna beat us. Is well, there scenarios like that, how effective the Buffalo soldiers were? Now, a lot of what we know about the Buffalo soldiers is oral history, uh, oral stories that have been passed on from soldier to soldier. So if you go back to 1865, okay, the Indians on the East Coast, they had seen black people, okay? In Alabama, Tennessee, mm -hmm. Kentucky, Indians had seen black people. But when you move out West at Texas and the Plain States, those Indians had never seen a black man before. Okay. All of a sudden they see this black man, a person with dark skin, short, woolly hair, and the Indians say that hair reminded them of the mane of the buffalo. And when they engaged in a battle, these black men, they fought like a wounded buffalo. So that's how we think that name Buffalo Soldier originated from Native Americans. Mm. Um, and so, uh, but then I, I, I like I, there was some intermingling between blacks and and like Seminole Indians and getting married and having kids and all that. How would so they that address was, that issue? Now that was in the east uh, on the east coast in Florida. The Seminoles were in Florida, so right. we're talking about a different band of Indians, Seminoles. But now when you move out west, we're talking about the Apache, the Cheyenne, uh, the Arapaho. We're talking about those those Indians out out west. Okay. What what when we, when when I think when I think of cowboys and Indians, excuse me for lack of using the word that analogy, yeah. but what does that compare? How does that deal with the Buffalo Soldiers? Is there is there any relation? I mean, I don't see I see white cowboys, so and they look like they always fight the Indians in the morning. Yeah, well, in my opinion, the in, the movies in Hollywood is kind of biased. If you take, especially if you're watching Cowboys and Indians and the fourth, and you're looking at primarily the cavalry soldiers, and when you're looking at these at these soldiers, you identify the cavalry with that that uh, yellow bandana that they are wearing. Okay, that yellow bandana represents the cavalry. And like I said, they are, they are carrying swords. All of those soldiers are white, but just paint those, that white face black and you have the Buffalo soldiers. Oh, really? Yes, sir. Hmm. Well, is, is, is the, uh, uh, oh man, so that's, so that's, so, so then, um, uh, if, is there any record of how many battles there really were, or it was so sporadic, or were there big battles between Buffalo and the Indians? Oh, absolutely. Now, I cannot give you a uh, a definitive number right yeah. at, this, this, at this moment, but no, there were numerous battles between the Buffalo soldiers and the Native American. Lots of battles, you know, uh, Anthony. And, and, and are there, uh, did the Indians have just bow and arrow, arrows or did they have guns too? Well, initially they started off with uh, bows and arrows, but they, before the, uh, the war was over, they had better weapons than the soldiers did. Really? We had, yeah, we had arms merchants. Now these arms merchants, they would sell guns to anybody. They didn't care who they sold their weapons really? to. Absolutely. So uh, doing the Battle of the Little Bits Bighorn with Custer's last stand, the Indians had better weapons than George Armstrong Custer did. Now, what's that story about the Custer's last stand? What is that? George Armstrong Custer. Right. <laughs> General, okay. Custer uh, was, uh, his assignment was to go into the Indian reservation and again, part of the Indian Removal Act and whatever, okay. So George, okay, George Armstrong Custer, now he had one black scout with him. His name was Isaiah Dorman, okay, the black scout. Dorman spoke several Indian languages. So he was the interpreter for Custer and the uh, Chief Sitting Bull, okay. In fact, Chief Sitting Bull knew Isaiah Dorman. But I uh, get the, the date, actual date right now, but. Uh, Custer's uh, charge at that time was to 
annihilate these Indians, get them off the, 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 the Black Hills, you know, territories or whatever, okay? But now these uh, uh, gun merchants, they had sold repeating, uh, see the army at that time, that, that rifle that you see, that Buffalo soldier, yeah, that's, here right there, that's a single shot uh, uh, weapon, okay? okay. Fire one shot, you had to reload it. I got you. Well, the Indians had repeaters, okay? They had better armed, they were better armed than, than the army were at that time. Like, so these are uh, these gun merchants, they didn't care who they sold their weapons. I got you. So the Indians were better armed than Custer. In fact, the Indians, they won that battle, okay? They killed almost all of, well, they killed Custer and all, all of his men, those who uh, did not, there were several of those Custer soldiers that ran away, okay? But other than that, the Indians won that battle. Hmm. They were better equipped, better armed than the, than Custer and the army. Uh, so what is it? The Indians got some land. They got these. Are they still living in teepees and that kind of thing? At that period of time, yes. See, all of this was in this was Indian country, and the United States that we wanted this country, this land that you guys are on now. We wanted that for white settlers. So you guys, the Indians, have to go. Those guys, the Indians here on the West Coast, they were rounded up and sent to Oklahoma. Now, you know, those Indians on the East Coast at the time, they were the Trail of Tears. Yeah. They were sent to Oklahoma, you know, also. Yeah. But so the, the, the role of the soldiers here in the West was to capture those Indians and head them to Oklahoma, put them on reservations in Oklahoma. Yeah. And make this uh, land here available for white settlers. Was there was there enough land in Oklahoma for all the Indians, or they were just crowding them in the they, areas or something? Do you no, know? Well, they threw them all over. They, irrespective of tribe. Now, all Indians did not get along with each other. Okay. Well, here did the United States government take that into account or consideration? Absolutely not. They put up patches with uh, with Seminoles or anybody else. They spoke different languages, different customs, different. They did not care. They stuck them all onto the reservation in, in Oklahoma. Was there a, a federal law that, that they enacted or something to, to, to do this? Well, you had the Indian Removal Act. Oh, really? Yes. So the territory that was occupied, when Europeans arrived in this, in North present day North America, what 16, 19, uh, 16, in the 1600s? This was all Native Americans. This was owned by Indians. Right. Okay. So uh, the Europeans, they wanted what these Native Americans owned. They, they had nice fertile soil, et cetera. So they wanted you know, what the Indians had. So, you know, they started, you know, the Indian Wars, yeah. take the land from the Indians on the East Coast. And like the, you had the Indian Removal, you know, Act. Yeah. Oh, my God. Uh, okay, so the Indians are sitting down in their, their, uh, their, on their territory and they're just making it, just living life. And then all of a sudden, here come a Buffalo soldier and a, and a trooper and they just start shooting at them? Yes, yes, uh-huh. Yes. So I'm having a decent time today, and all of a sudden, I got to go get my gun and shoot back at these guys, uh, and they just shooting and killing me. Yeah, because they knew when they saw the army, the army was not there on a peaceful mission, okay? Mm. When they saw the wagon trails, uh, the wagon trains, okay? Now, see, these people from the East Coast, these Europeans, they're leaving, say, St. Louis, and they're heading to California, right? In order to get to California, you're going through Indian territory. Indians are saying, hey, this is our territory. You don't have permission to be here. We're going to attack and we're going to kill you. So the army said, okay, let's protect these settlers moving west and let's use the army. And part of the army would be the Buffalo soldiers to mm. protect those settlers. There was no living together. Oh, no, absolutely not. Now, when I say absolutely not now, you're gonna always have a few that will cross the line. So there were a few Europeans who were able to go into the Indian reservations and get along you know, with them, but not in masses, no. 
What was the Indians' take on black people doing this to them? Did they did they look at us like uh, we both brothers or something like that? Or they, as they looked at the black Buffalo soldiers different than the white soldiers, was there a different perspective in that regard? They looked at them as enemies. They were the enemy. But here again, from our research, they the black soldiers were not treated as hostile as white soldiers were. Okay. White soldiers were accustomed to scalping. You've heard the term scalping native yeah. Americans? Well, there's very little evidence to prove that black soldiers actually did a, a lot of scalping, okay? So they were a little more humane, if yeah, you will. Yeah, that sounds pretty, uh, what is scalping? I mean, if you don't mind, I never understood it, but what is that, you know? Okay, now, you know, white people normally have long hair, right? Yeah. So the scalping is to pull that hair and take a knife and cut your hair off. Not the scalp per se though. It well, when you cut the hair, it cuts down to the scalp, yes. And that hair, in a lot of cases, was sold you know, to other you know, traders or whatever, yes. Oh, oh now, really? Your hair and my hair, it would be kind of hard for an Indian yeah. to scalp us. Right, sure, <laughs> sure, sure, sure. So scalping was the, 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 the process of cutting that person's hair off down to the scalp. Oh, so they used that and then that might have started the first wigs or something like that. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, yeah, they, they, they wish this was getting weeds back then. <laughs> From Indian hair. Now, was there something uh, to the Buffalo soldiers um, where they all had to be a certain height or weight or any requirements like that? For the cavalry soldiers, there were there was a height and weight limitation for a cavalry soldier, and that was based on the horse. See, the horse had to carry that soldier as well as all the equipment. So a cavalry soldier would have stood approximately five feet six, five feet seven, probably weighed around 150 pounds for a cavalryman. Now an infantryman could weigh as be as tall as as, as I'm six feet four. Yeah. But uh, the cavalrymen had to be around five feet six, five feet seven, weigh around 150, 160 pounds. Because, like I said, a horse had to carry not only that soldier, but all of the equipment. So we had to look out, you know, for the horse. Is there a, a Buffalo soldier that, that became uh, famous, some name, uh, a celebrity for some accomplishments or something like that? Is there one name that sticks out? Henry Ocean Flipper was the first African-American cadet to graduate from West Point Military Academy. Okay. Henry O. Flipper, yeah. 1887, okay. He was the first officer, a colored cadet to graduate from West Point. So of course, when he arrived at West Point, they gave him the silent treatment. Yeah. That no other cadet would even speak to him unless it was an official line of duty. So for four years, that's what, that's what Flipper endured so flipper was the first and then you know uh, then we go there are several who, who came after flipper yeah but, but what's the connection there the buffalo soldier because well, he flipper, oh when flipper graduated from west point he was assigned to uh, the ninth cavalry buffalo soldier he was assigned to a buffalo soldier unit oh okay is there a buffalo soldier that's known to be uh that has killed a lot of indians or something like that that made a name for itself So during the Indian Wars, 1866 until around eight, uh, 1888, 1889, there were 18 Buffalo soldiers who were awarded the, the military's highest military award honor, which is our Medal of Honor. Okay. And for various reasons, one. For various, for various reasons within counted within uh, the, with, uh, the Native Americans, yes. Uh, when did the uh, the Buffalo soldiers? When did they? When can they say the work was complete? When did they get all the Indians and now we can, we can stop this effort? Is there such a time as that per se? Sure. I, no, I think around 1887, 1887, 1889. Geronimo surrendered. Okay, Geronimo was a, an Apache uh, uh, Indian chief. He. Uh, when he, when Geronimo surrendered, 
that almost officially ended what we know as the Indian Wars. There were some several other smaller bands still uh, raiding, okay? But when Geronimo surrendered, I think 1889, that's when the Indian Wars officially ended. So that's from 65 to 89 is uh, 24 years. Something like that, yes. As, 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 as long as that is. Um, when it ends, what happens to the Buffalo Soldiers? Okay, prior, okay, now, the, when Geronimo surrendered 1889, 1890, we had the Spanish-American War. That's where Teddy Roosevelt rode up San Juan Hill in Cuba. You remember that? Yeah, okay. That okay. That's now, that's the only time that all four Buffalo Soldier regiments, the 9th and 10th Cavalry, the 24th and the 25th Infantry Regiment, they were all at San Juan, okay? Now, when the, that battle was over, the army was in the process of getting rid of what we call the, the horse cavalry, and they were replacing the horse with the automobile. Okay. Around early, early 1900s. Okay. Those senior non-commissioned officers who were good equestrians, horsemen, whatever, they were sent to West Point to, um, to teach the West Point cadets how to ride horses. And so that's the end of the soldiers era. Well, that was the end of the Buffalo soldier era, but now the soldiers who came after, even the World War I soldiers, they, and World War II soldiers, they all adopted the name Buffalo soldier. Oh, really? Okay. So in 1948, that's when President Truman officially uh, desegregated the military. Okay, 1948. Okay. Yeah. Now, there are no more segregated units. There are no more all black units. Now right. black units are merged into the regular army. So yeah, 1940, that was 1948 is when the executive order was issued. So by 1954, at the end of the Korean War, there were no more segregated units within the army. So we stopped using the term Buffalo Soldier after the end of World War I. I mean, World War II yeah. and Korea. Is that, if I'm a Buffalo soldier and I run into another Buffalo soldier, do I greet him in some specific language like, hey, Buffalo man, or, I mean, is it, you know what I'm saying? Do they have some unique traits among themselves, you think? Well, back in the day, no, sir. <laughs> okay. Now, today we have Buffalo soldier organizations all over the United States. So we have our little, our code, you know, if you will. Now here I have, I don't know if you can see this, a challenge coin. This is a Buffalo Soldier challenge coin. This is one of the things that we issue to all new members who join our organization. Okay. Once we issue you this coin, now, if once we, if I see you in a bar or any place downtown, if I have my coin, I can challenge you. If you don't have yours, you buy a round of beer. <laughs> Except, oh, really? Okay. This is a challenge coin. So if you're a Buffalo Soldier today, you, might, you should have one of these coins. You carry that with you everywhere you go. Everywhere I go, because if another Buffalo soldier challenge, uh, meets me, and you can see how I'm dressed, okay? Yeah. If he challenged me and I don't have my coin. <laughs> I got you. I'm subject to buying a round of beer. Why, why, let me, uh, uh, okay. So now the Buffalo soldiers keep going. I know you got your organization. There's chat, is there, is there a national organization and then sub chapters? Yeah, the, I think they're the, Buffalo Soldier Organization in New Orleans, Louisiana. I can give you inf more information, you know, yeah. on those guys. But yeah, there's a Buffalo Soldier chapter in probably all 50 states. And, and you said where you are located is the headquarters? I mean, you're telling me that. The reason we call Fort Huachuca the home of the Buffalo Soldier is because all the units, the 9th and Cavalry were actually here. The 10th, the, the 9th and the 10th were here, the 24th and the 25th Infantry Regiment, they were all stationed at Fort Huachuca at one time. This is the only post where all four regiments were actually stationed. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, the 92nd and the 93rd Infantry Division, those were the two black infantry divisions for World War II. They were all stationed here at Fort Huachuca. Okay. So all of those men we call Buffalo Soldiers were actually stationed here at Fort Huachuca. Is there a uh, 
what was the racial makeup uh, at the fort? I mean, you got Buffalo soldiers and you have white soldiers at the fort, or that's where they sent all the black soldiers. Oh no, they were they they were uh, they were black and white. The Fort Huachuca was established in 1877. Now those were all white soldiers here. Now the buff first Buffalo soldiers arrived in Fort Huachuca in 18 when 1892 is when the first black soldiers arrived here at Fort Huachuca in 1892. You said 1892 compared to 1865 when the Buffalo soldiers first started. Yeah, they, the 18, well, 1866 is when they started. Okay, but the Buffalo soldiers did not arrive here in Arizona, Fort Huachuca. Oh, they were other places. They were other they places. Were, yeah, they were other places, yeah. Kansas you. and Montana, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Why does someone want to be a Buffalo soldier? I mean, what's, you know, I mean, I don't have, you know, for anybody, what's, because you like what they do, what they stood for, what, why does somebody want to be a Buffalo soldier? Well, now today I'm not, uh, I, uh, I am a storyteller. We, the, the, there are no more Buffalo soldiers today. We're all storytellers now. Okay. Oh, so all the chapters are just to tell the story of the Buffalo yes, yeah. Soldiers. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. Do y'all have events like a national convention or something? Yes, they do. And and are, are there uh, some place where there's Buffalo Soldiers enactments or whatever where people oh, oh, that kind of thing? Uh, that, that, as, as we come to a close, and I hope you don't mind this ask, ask this question. This don't sound good. That they use the black people to get rid of the Indians. I hear Even you. Brother. We, we know about how they've done us. I hear is you. A, is that a proud history for us, per se? Me personally, I think it is, yeah. Because if you talk to most, all of us uh, who tell the story about Buffalo soldiers, we consider it an honor to represent the Buffalo soldier and tell the story. There's more to this story. And you and I are discussing right okay. now. So we consider it an honor to be affiliated with Buffalo Soldiers. Okay. And it was an honor for them men to go in there and to open up the country like they did against the Indians. Although they are just off the reservation. Now, that's not the, the slave plantation, Anthony. These people, in my opinion, and what we know, they wanted to be included within the United States to live that American dream. They wanted to be inclusive. I got they felt that by joining the forces, if you will, they would number one gain full citizenship, which we oh, know really? they didn't. Okay, which we know they didn't. Okay, but they thought that this was one way of gaining citizenship and becoming a true American. Yes, so they were proud of what they did. Here again, from now, they did a lot of killing before. So the research that we have done and conducted, they did not do, they did not go overboard like some of the European soldiers did. Yeah. They didn't go in and massacre families and all oh, that. No, 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 no. There's no uh, evidence that I can relate to you now. I can tell you plenty of stories where uh, European soldiers, they went into Indian reservations and they killed women, children. It didn't matter. Peaceful Indians. Okay, there's no records of any black or buffalo soldiers, you know, doing anything. Oh, like okay, that. okay, I can like that, Dan. I can like that. Now, what's the uh, website for your, uh, your, your your chapter there and so on and so forth? It's SWABS. SWAB stand for uh, SWAB, S W A B S stand for Southwest Association of Buffalo Soldiers. So it's SWABS Buffalo Soldiers. Uh, net. You can get our website. Okay. Is there, is there uh, the Buffalo Soldiers have a color uh, combination that they wear or something like that? Their, their outer garment, like the, the, the sweat t shirt, is black. But if you see here, uh, this shirt here, yeah. the, yeah, ye the yellow scarf. Yeah. Okay. The sabers here, okay, this is a cavalry guy. Okay, he's a cavalry you know, guy. And we, you can't see it here. There's a, a buffalo you know, here. Yeah. And this is a guy who was riding a horse here. So our colors are normally black and yellow or black and gold. Oh, I got you. So part of our job is to, our mission rather, is to go to schools, universities, college, social events or whatever, and spread the word you know, to as many people as possible who these people were. They were instrumental in 
settling what we know as especially the western part of the United States. Is there a monument, like a big monument to Buffalo Soldiers somewhere? Okay, the, the statue behind me, that's the first Buffalo Soldier statue that was dedicated specifically to the Buffalo Soldiers in 1977, that, you, that uh, statue was created. Mm, okay. Fort Leavenworth has a huge display of the Buffalo Soldiers because the 10th Cavalry stood up at Fort Leavenworth, you know, Kansas. So they have probably had the, the largest Buffalo okay. Soldier display okay. at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Okay. Other states like El Paso, Texas, there's a Buffalo Soldier Monument, Huntsville, Alabama. There are statues all over the United States. But I said the largest one would probably be the one at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Okay. Okay. Well, hey, everybody, uh, that's the real story on the Buffalo Soldiers. I, I didn't know. Uh, I, I, until now, I really didn't. And and, and I, I, I got mixed emotions, but I do like it that the black men did what they did. Um, I appreciate you doing what you're doing, keeping this history alive. Um, uh, and everybody, this is what we do on Strong Inspirations. I find that these people, they knowledgeable. They, this is what they do, and they sharing it with us. And I thank you for doing that. And to you know, the viewers, I you know, come on and hit the subscribe button, uh, like this video for sure, because you learned something. I know you did, because I did. Uh, hit that notifications bell. Watch my movie. Read my book. Uh, go to the website. Let's uh, find out about all the chapters and, and let's lend some support so that they can keep that history and keep it alive. And to you, my brother, I want to say I thank you for being on the channel. I want you to do this for sure. And that is stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind because we really appreciate what you do. Bye-bye. Appreciate it. Take care. Have a great day. You too.